Hey fellow workers, my name is Kim Siever, and you're turning into episode one of the Alberta Worker podcast. So as you can probably guess, this is a brand new podcast coming onto the scene. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what my goal is with this podcast. Then as the first guest for the podcast, I will interview myself. So if anybody's been following the Alberta Worker Project over the last couple of years. The Alberta Worker is a independent media outlet that focuses on political news and labor news, mostly in Alberta, but also some Canada news and um, a little bit in Lethbridge as well. It used to be called Kim Zeber News, but honestly, I didn't really like it that much. And some people didn't take me too seriously when they would come across a news article on Kim Siever News and so I was wanting to rebrand it for quite a while and I settled on the Alberta Worker because I realized that in the two years that I had been working on the project that I started to get a little bit of a focus into labor news and economic news so this seemed like a good fit. With that change one of the things that I had in mind in the future was to do a podcast. Now I wanted to do a little bit different of a podcast. I didn't just want another leftist podcast out there. So what I'm hoping to do with the Alberta Worker podcast is to tell worker stories from worker perspectives. Specifically, I want to tell the stories of marginalized workers. I don't think Alberta or leftist media needs another group of white cis straight dudes talking about leftist politics. I mean, I'm not technically straight, but I'm cis and I'm white and I'm a dude. And so I could probably fit in there as well. And so while I'm not going to never interview someone who's white, straight and cis, I want to be able to provide a larger voice for marginalized workers. So women and other genders, black and indigenous workers and other workers of color, disabled workers, workers who are marginalized based on their economic class like they might have to work you know three part-time jobs because they can't get a full-time job or maybe they haven't been in a uh, situation where they can go back to school and or ever get a full-time job and, and those sorts of things so people coming from diverse backgrounds but who are marginalized in ways other than the being a member of the working class i think it'd be a way for to us to focus on economic challenges that workers face as they intersect with other issues that that fit people face as well as they deal with racism and sexism and homophobia and all those sorts of different things. And so that's my hope for this podcast is to tell worker stories from a worker perspective with a focus on marginalized workers. And another thing with the podcast is that my schedule doesn't allow me to do a weekly podcast. What this podcast is going to be is going to be a season based podcast. And so I'm going to be putting out weekly podcasts, but only for a certain period every year, generally throughout the summer. A lot of podcasts take time off in the summertime, and so this will be an opportunity for you to be able to have some content to listen to when your favorite podcasts have taken a summer break. During the school year, I'm a lot busier, and so I don't have the capacity to be able to do a weekly podcast at this moment. Maybe in the, f in the near future I might be able to, but not that I can see uh, this year or maybe even next year but i thought a summer podcast would be a great way to for me to be able to do it because my um my schedule frees up a little bit more and so that's what i'm hoping to do over the next few couple of months i hope to do a weekly podcast and i'm not sure how many it's going to be maybe eight maybe ten something along those lines and so today is number one i already have interviews lined up for episode two and episode three which I might talk about at the end of this podcast. And so that's really the background on my podcast. I don't know how long each episode is going to be. This is my first go at it. I'm just going to go in and tell my story and then we'll see how long it goes from there. And then uh, next week when you tune in, I will have my first interview and we'll tell that person's story and we'll see how it goes from there and see if it's going to take 20 minutes if it's gonna be 30 minutes if it's gonna be an hour I, i'm not sure how long it's gonna take and then of course i'll have to edit it down and so tune in next week and see if next week's 
episode is, is just as long as this episode. So I think that's pretty much all of it. Now I'm just going to focus right on into my own personal history. I'm going to talk a little bit about where I grew up and a little bit about my family background and then go into my own personal labor history and kind of how I ended up where I am now. So I was born in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, but we moved from there when I was just a baby. We moved to Calgary uh, again for just a few months. And actually for the next several uh, years, I just moved around from small town to small town, living with various family members, my grandparents, my biological fathers, relatives, going back and forth between these different towns until I finally ended up in Regina. My mom and my biological father had separated. I ended up moving in with my little sister and my mom to live with another man and his three young sons. To make a long story short, this man and this woman got married and we became a blended family. So my mom was 21 at the time and now had five children, all five years old or younger. And so that was an interesting experience growing up. My stepdad, who I was raised with since I was four years old, like four and a half, he's functionally my dad and I call him my dad whenever I'm talking about him or to him. And so from here on out, if I mention him, I'm going to call him my dad and that's who I'm referring to. I haven't had any contact with my biological father since I was 14 and I haven't seen him in person since I was eight. There's a complicated history there I'm not going to get into right now that would probably double the length of this podcast, but... So my dad worked in construction and, and still does to a degree. The entire time I've known him, he's worked in construction. Primarily, he's worked in installing walls and ceilings. He would install steel studs and tracks, and then he would install drywall on top of that framing. And he would also install acoustic ceiling tiles or drywall ceiling as well. And so that's what he did for... Um, pretty much all of my time growing up with him. And another thing too is whenever I refer to my stepbrothers, I just call them my, my brothers. And so when my youngest sibling entered into school, my mom started going back to school and she ended up becoming a nurse. And so here we were growing up in this family where my dad was a construction worker and my mom was a nurse. And that's the, that's the life I lived in. We moved away around from house to house every couple of years, still staying in with Regina for most of that time. I ended up going to six different schools when I lived in Regina. Five of those were elementary schools and we lived in government housing a couple of times. My dad would get laid off and so we would end up having to move because we couldn't afford the mortgage anymore and that sort of thing. Just before I turned 16, my dad and mom moved us out to BC where the economic situation was a lot better. The economic situation in Regina wasn't that great. My dad was having a hard time finding dependable reliable work and so we move, all moved to bc against my wishes i did not want to leave my friends for my last two years of high school but it had been two years since we moved and so it's time to move again and so we moved and i don't ever remember my mom working as a nurse after we moved so my guess is she never registered as a nurse once we moved to bc she didn't really need to work my dad was making a lot more money in bc than he ever did in regina and so she didn't really need to work we were better off financially there in fact it was the first time we were ever able to buy a brand new vehicle after we had moved there, which was pretty nice. So we moved to BC. I f finished my last two years of high school in Abbotsford. Pretty much after I graduated, we moved into Surrey, a little bit closer to Vancouver. It made it easier for my dad to commute. It was a little bit more central of location. And we moved to a pretty nice place, actually. It was big. It was almost an acre size lot and lots of fruit trees. It was an older house, but I got my own room, which is something I didn't have growing up. I always had to share. There was a time when all four of us boys were sleeping in one bedroom. So it was nice to have my own room. And then I went on my Mormon mission. I got back after a couple years, got married, and we spent the first three years of our marriage in Surrey. Then we moved to Lethbridge to transfer to the University of Lethbridge. And we've been in Lethbridge ever since. So that's pretty much my personal history. My spouse Mary and I got married in May of 1995. So we just barely celebrated our 27th anniversary. And we have six children. Children. Our oldest is 23. Our youngest is just about seven. Might have actually had her birthday by the time you hear this. Still not sure when I'm going to be releasing these podcasts. Or it might even be her birthday. Yeah, and so our two oldest are in their 20s, working and figuring out, balancing work with post-secondary education. We have a child in high school, a child in middle school, and our two youngest are homeschooled. Well, kind of like a hybrid. So they do 
kind of distance learning through a school district up in Vermillion, but then we kind of help out with some of the paperwork and we work through a facilitator and stuff. And so it's just kind of this hybrid thing. So that's where we're sitting at. And we live in a house just south of downtown Lethbridge and in the Rainbow House, which you've probably heard of. If you pay attention to Alberta politics, it's probably come up. So yeah, that's my personal history. If you have any questions about that, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can post a question in the comments below and I can answer that question later on. But I think now I'll go into my work history. So I think the first job I ever had was delivering flyers. And actually at one point, my mom and dad ended up taking over the distribution managing position. They would manage in several routes within the neighborhood where I was delivering. And so they ended up becoming my bosses. I think it was twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays, I would go and deliver various flyers to um, within my neighborhood. I did just one street. I think it did five or six blocks, something like that. And I would just deliver the flyers. Got some spending money, which is pretty cool. We lived pretty close to a strip mall that had a Toys R Us. So I'd go there and buy some cool stuff sometimes. And we also lived pretty much kitty corner from a convenience store. So I'd go there and smirch my money on crispy crunches and frescas and butter tarts and stuff. So yeah, it was a pretty cool time with this first job. And then I stopped doing it when I found out that we were going to have to deliver phone books. And I was like, <laughs> There's no way I'm carrying all those phone books across my 13 year old scrawny shoulders. I quit my route um, before I got a chance to do that. And then the next job I had was kind of like casual stuff. It, my, I would just help my dad sometimes do uh, clean up at his construction sites. He'd be finished a job and there'd be so much garbage. He just need someone to come in and give him a hand. So we would sometimes go, go in there and give him a hand. And I can't remember if he paid us or anything, but I mean, it still worked. So it, it, it is labor. And the next real job I had was a fry cook at McDonald's. I did that in my first year in high school after we moved to Abbotsford. So, I mean, technically it was my third year in high school, but I also fried a few burgers, but mostly I, I didn't do the fries. Somebody else always did the fries, but I think I helped them out once or twice once or twice. And, oh, I also did chicken McNuggets. So I did chicken McNuggets, pies, chicken patties, and fish patties. Not only would I fry them, but that I would put the, the chicken sandwiches and the fish sandwiches together as well. So that was mostly my job. And then I'd like get supplies and stuff like that, wash the floors, whatever, take out garbages, you know, just general stuff like that. So that was my real first paid job. I didn't get a job after that until we moved to Surrey after I graduated. There was a gas station, just a sort of around the corner from us. It was probably like a 10 minute walk, maybe even less than that. I phoned them up one day, asked them if they were hiring. They said to come in for with my resume and for an interview. So I did and I got hired on the spot, which is pretty cool. And so I worked as a gas jockey for uh, several months anyhow. And I worked primarily the graveyard shift, which was kind of cool because I was, you know, 17 slash 18 years old at the time. And my coworker that I worked with the most, at first it wasn't like that, but uh, after, he came on about a month or so after I did. And then we prep worked almost always together at the same shifts. And so we got to know each other really well. And he was around my age too. And so we, you know, we chat lots about lots of cool stuff. And we were both pretty young and energetic, had lots of energy and strength and stuff. And so, you know, working midnight shift five days a week wasn't that big of a deal for us. And we had lots of fun. And then uh, we'd sleep in, in the mornings and then wake up and go hang out on Saturdays and stuff and do stuff on the weekends together. But I did that for a few months and then uh, and then they moved me to one of their other locations. So I would guess my, that was my second gas jockey job, but it was with the same company. So I don't know, different location. And then they started cutting my hours and eventually I just quit. I just wasn't making enough money. And if I'm not gonna be making much money, I can get make not much money not working or going to work somewhere else. And so I did that. And then I tried to do MLM uh, with Herbalife for a little while. <laughs> I found out I sucked at sales. And so I tried, I phoned so many people and nobody wanted to buy the stuff. And I had all this shake powder that I had to use up. And I was so scrawny. I was like 6'2", 150 pounds. And these shakes weren't working. <laughs> I couldn't put on any weight. It's was like, I can't even say that these things work for me. Uh, I sucked at it. And so that was short lived. And so my dad asked me to come work for him. He was still working in construction and he needed a laborer and so that's what I did. I would help him haul bundles of steel studs or track. I would uh, cut them up for him. I would help him lay down lines with the chalk line. I would help put on waterproof membrane around the edges for when they put up the exterior walls and stuff. He helped build a, an apartment building in Gastown in Vancouver and I helped him um, install acoustic ceiling tiles in uh, a couple of uh, buildings in an industrial park in Richmond. And then of course I was responsible for 
general cleanup of the materials and whatnot as well. And so I worked there for quite a few months, made some pretty good money and learned a lot about hard work and the trades and that sort of thing. I didn't end up going into the trades because I, I kind of hated the work. It's just, it was really, it was much harder work than I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And my dad was dealing with health issues related to it as well. So I was like, I didn't want to have to do that. And then, like I said, I went, spent two years on my Mormon mission and then I came back home and looked for work for a little while but then I ended up getting a job at a gas station that was probably like a 15-20 minute walk from where I lived. I wasn't a gas jockey. I was back to doing graveyard shift. I was the gas station attendant so I was inside and I would approve people's purchases for gas and that sort of thing and then sell them like convenience store stuff, snacks and coffee and whatnot when they'd come in. It was a lot bigger of a, a gas station than I was generally used to. And so there was a lot more there for people to buy. And so yeah, then I would just do general cleanup and stuff. I didn't have anybody to hang out with when I was there. And like that other job I was telling you about, it's just me and the radio for my seven hour shifts. Did that for a couple months, but then I started having health issues. I lost like 20 pounds and I was constantly tired. And I realized that I was not 17 years old anymore and it was much harder working their graveyard shift. And so I ended up quitting. A few weeks later, I got a job as a courier with a downtown courier company in Vancouver. A lot, I had a lot of friends who were bike couriers or car couriers, but I didn't have a bike or a car. And so I ended up being a walking courier. And so I would walk from building to building in downtown Vancouver, delivering packages for various companies and corporate clients and that sort of thing. But then uh, my dispatcher would also send me on the SkyTrain, which is like an LRT system in Vancouver. And so I would sometimes take um, deliveries to destinations that were further out. Which is fine for me because the our billing system was based on uh, distance. It was based on the speed that you needed the package to get there as well on as on distance. And so the further out you went, the more expensive the package was. And so the more money I got because I would get a percentage of the price of the delivery. Uh, I did that for four or five months, something like that. And then my boss texted my pager one time and uh, asked me to phone him. I phoned him and he offered me an inside job, a desk job. And so I took that and ended up becoming a call taker. And I was a call taker for about a year. And I would just take the orders in and so our clients would phone in to the general switchboard number and one of us would pick up there were several of us called takers I think three or four of us and we'd pick up and we'd enter in the delivery pickup place delivery place how fast they wanted to get their pickup times that sort of thing and I would enter in and then when, when I press enter we go off to the dispatcher screen and so I did that for a few months uh, about a year or so and then I got promoted to a uh, dispatcher position and so I did backup dispatch for the main dispatchers. I had my own little fleet of cycling couriers, but they weren't specifically downtown. They would pick up downtown and then they would deliver on the south side. So uh, Pulse Creek and Kitsilano, like near Kitsilano area and that sort of thing. So, and then I also did a few short haul drivers as well. They didn't go too far out. They would just go down into Vancouver. Just had my small fleet and then I did backup for the others. So the others would go home early and I'd stay until the office shut down for do an extra hour. So I'd come in a little bit later and I would stay a little bit later to be able to help cover their routes as drivers would drop off their deliveries and then head home. And so I did that until I went back to school and or not back to school, but I went to school. I started at Douglas College in the fall of 1997 and I was working on an associate arts degree majoring in French and I did that for about a year and then I transferred to the U of L. The thing is though is that when we decided to move to the U of L we had nowhere to live and I didn't have a job and so we ended up getting a place on campus university managed housing and so we just signed up for one of theirs so we were at least guaranteed a place to live and they would just take the rent out of the student loans that I would get and so we didn't have to worry about paying rent while we were there. And then after uh, a few days, I was able to find another gas jockey job. So I think this is my, I think we're up to, oh no, actually I forgot. There was also a, before we moved to Lethbridge, the, I got a jo uh, second job working night shift again. I said I would never do night shift again, but here I was doing night shift on the weekends as a gas station attendant. And oh my goodness, I was so tired. So I got the job so we could save up some money to move to Lethbridge. I was so tired. I was I would work Thursday nights and Friday nights. Fridays, I was so, so tired at my other job. So what I would do is I would come home from my regular job at about 6 o'clock on Thursday night. And then I would try to go to sleep to wake up at 9 o'clock. And then I wake up at 9 o'clock, I would have something to eat. So kind of like my breakfast. 
and then I go catch the bus at 10 o'clock. Then I start my shift at, at 11. And I would work from 11 to 7. And then at 7 o'clock, I would catch the bus. I would come home. I would arrive home at about 7.30. And I have to catch the bus at 7.45. And so my spouse had actually was kind enough to make breakfast for me on Fridays. And so breakfast was ready for when I walked in the door. And I'd quickly get changed out of my uh, uniform from my other job. Get changed into my work clothes for my regular job. And then I eat breakfast real quickly and then out the door to catch the bus to be at my other job and where I would once again work and come home, be home at six o'clock, try to sleep for three hours, get up, eat, and then so on. And But the Friday was the day that was really killer for me. Saturday wasn't a big deal because I would just be able to come home and I could just sleep like normal. But Friday, it was tough. And I was basically running on, off of three hours of sleep on Fridays and I often would fall asleep when I was taking calls and orders for the, the courier company. One time I fell asleep, I was trying to walk up the stairs to get my bag. It was tough, it was it was really tough. Anyhow, so after we moved to Lethbridge, I was phoning around trying to get a job and I found this job as a gas jockey at another gas station. I got the job and worked there for a week, but I, I just wasn't making enough money. I wasn't getting enough shifts, it wasn't full time, and I was getting paid minimum wage, which I don't remember what it was at the, at the time, but my first, paycheck was less than $200 and there's just no way I was going to be able to live like that and so looking for more work and I found another job and so I took the second job quit my first job as the gas jockey and that was the last gas station job I've ever had since then so I worked as a carpet cleaner for a year just cleaning carpets re residential and commercial institutional carpets did that for a year did it full-time during the summer and then part-time when I was in school and so it was, it was pretty decent money it wasn't enough like I would probably get around 500 600 bucks on my paychecks so it was okay but like you couldn't live off that full-time going to school part-time it was okay it was tough on my health though I was dealing with some arthritic pain especially my my hips and and my knees so just the movements of the machines i think was aggravating that and so after about a year working for the company i i gave my notice and i ended up not working for them anymore and then like a month later i dropped out of university so i was just gonna go to school full time and i was gonna just live off my uh, student loans and stuff but we had some financial problems because when we moved here we hadn't lived in alberta long enough to qualify for alberta student loans and bc student loans would only pay for your schooling in another province if you couldn't get that schooling in bc and so we didn't get provincial student loans we got only national student loans and that was like five thousand dollars for the entire school year so we basically had five thousand dollars to live off of plus however few hundred dollars i would be able to supplement with the part-time work I had with the carpet cleaning company. And as a result, our bill started to pile up because we weren't able to pay them regularly. And we got taken to court for one of the creditors. We went into collections on another and they started um, taking money out of our bank account. We actually ended up closing our bank account because of it, because we couldn't buy any groceries because we had, they would take all of our money and we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves. I remember rolling coins that we would find around the house and cushions and drawers and stuff rolling coins so we'd have enough money to go buy a bag of fruit one bag of fruit or we would be in the grocery store with $18 trying to decide whether we are going to buy some more groceries or buy a single package of diapers for our brand new baby our firstborn and so it was really tough and when it came down to it three weeks uh, into my second year of university we couldn't do it anymore I dropped out and got a job because we needed to make money and we needed to get caught up on our bills. And so I took a job as a clerk at a organic market, just a small little thing in Chinatown here in Lethbridge. And she first hired me, the owner first hired me to do some database work. But after a while, once I got everything entering, she started having me um, ringing through groceries and receiving packages and deliveries and labeling stuff with prices and cleaning things up and, and, and that sort of thing. But after a month or so, she said she didn't have enough work for me anymore. And I, she ended up letting me go. Funny thing though, is like a couple minutes later, we went back there to buy something and there was another fellow working there and doing basically the same thing I was doing. And then they ended up getting together and were in a relationship. And I think actually they're still together. So yeah, I'm not sure that she couldn't pay me after all. So there might've been some other reasons for letting me go. Anyhow, so I ended up with another courier company, but this time one in Lethbridge. And I would just drive around delivering packages for people, picking them up and delivering them. And it was a full-time job. So it was pretty cool, pretty good money. It was eight bucks an hour, which I, I'm pretty sure was above minimum wage at the time, but it was pretty good. There was some hard labor and some of the packages we'd have to deliver 
flavor were pretty heavy but it wasn't too bad like it wasn't sometimes it was just envelopes and stuff and a lot of driving you do some driving and then you do some delivering and so yeah it wasn't too bad they were early starts to the day but then i'd be done like before four o'clock so that was kind of cool and then we didn't have a vehicle and so i was able to bring the company vehicle home which is kind of handy yeah and so then i did that for I don't know, probably about six months or so and then i realized i didn't want to do that for very long and so i actually ended up enrolling at the local college for a multimedia production program i had heard about it through when i had that carpet cleaning company the owner's two sons had gone into the program and so i chatted with them a little bit about it and so that's how i found out about it and so i entered in and completed it and uh, for part of the education you had to do a practicum so i did a practicum with one of the faculties at the university of lethbridge and they had me managing their website so the intent was originally they would bring on students after a student was done they would keep the student on for a casual position for a semester and then they'd bring another student on once that second student uh, moved into the uh, contract position the casual position the first student would be let go and then they bring another student on and they would just rotate through the students once they brought me on and saw how good i was because i already had been developing websites for about four years i think by the time I got my job there. And so I'd already had some experience and knew quite a bit of what to do compared to the person who was supposed to be mentoring me. I already knew quite a bit more. And so they changed their mind and they just kept me on. And so I ended up staying on there for nine years, nine years if you include my practicum time. And then they let me go after the province introduced funding freezes and um, my department was cut in half. And I was one of the ones who had to be let go. That was tough. We tried to run an um, online retail company for a few months after that. I got a pretty good severance package. We were able to survive off that for about six months. And the business didn't run very well, and so I had to go look for a job. I ended up getting a job with a shipping company, and they shipped um, throughout the United States. They would also pick up packages at the U.S.-Mexico border, and then across Canada as well, down to Montreal and Vancouver. In between the various points along the way, they had depots in major cities along that route. And so I worked there for a about six months as a fleet manager. I was responsible for a little over 50 truckers and would make sure that their they would get their deliveries assigned and then I would follow up with them to make sure that everything's going well, that they're um, they're keeping their temperatures and their traders at the right temperature, that they're not having any problems, that they're making good progress and, and that sort of thing. I would be the liaison between them and the dispatchers. I technically wasn't a dispatcher. I wouldn't plan their trips or anything like that. I would just be watching them to make sure that everything's going all good. But it was a very hectic environment. There's a lot of backbiting in that environment. There was sexual harassment in that workplace. There was a lot of yelling and swearing, and which like normally I'm not affected by swearing, but it was just constant. And it, when you pair it with all these other things like backbiting and, and yelling and stuff, it was just really caustic. And I ended up developing depression and, and anxiety, like crippling depression and anxiety. I get home from work and I would just go to bed and I would just lie there catatonic because I couldn't deal with things. If I had a meeting in the evenings I had to go to, then I would go to it, but I wouldn't participate very much in those meetings. It was a really hard job. And um, at, at one point I said, okay, I can't do this anymore. And I was motivated to enroll back in school. And so I did and I got accepted to U L, and I told my boss that I was leaving um, on May 1st was gonna be my last day I wanted to go out earlier but he asked if I could just stay up to May 1st and I said okay fine whatever and then I started back to school and this time I was gonna stay I was gonna finish it and I had 19 classes left to finish my degree and so I did whatever it took I was gonna make sure I was gonna stick with it and finish it and I did I finished it, uh, all my coursework at the end of 2012 and then I convocated in 2013 but during that time I got a couple jobs there was during the summer of 2011 I found a job at doing processing for a company that would facilitate temporary foreign workers coming to Lethbridge and not just temporary foreign workers but people who needed student visas work visas things like that as well and so I would help making sure the paperwork was in the proper order and, and that sort of thing so basically an administrative assistant but I wasn't paying very well I wasn't getting very many hours and so uh, it was okay but not what I wanted and I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life and then a website visit development position came up and I didn't really want to go into that field but it's like you know I got 
got to do something. And I know how to develop websites. And so I had an interview with this company. They were so impressed with the things that we talked about. They ended up actually giving me a different position. They gave the website position to somebody else and they developed a communication specialist position for me. So then I would manage their social media, uh, email newsletter and their print newsletter, manage uh, copy editing and writing for them and all that sort of thing. It was a great job. I really, really enjoyed it a lot. And I learned a ton. They ended up having some funding issues. And so they had to let me go. Uh, and I had been there about a year and a half, I think, when they let me go. And that was the last paid job I've had. Well, not exactly. So I ended up, uh, after I left there, I ended up um, working for myself. My plan was originally to go and start my master's degree. And that was part of the reason they let me go is because I wouldn't be able to work more than 10 hours a week while I was doing my master's. And so I decided, well, we might as well just let him go now. And then I, my master's application was denied. And so I was like, well, I could have kept working there. But whatever i actually kept them on as a, a client and so i worked for myself I, I tried to get a job working somewhere else but i just couldn't find anything and i just decided to just go into business for myself and so i so i managed to convince them to come on as my first client and i thought if i could just get a couple more clients i could make it work so i wasn't making as much money as i was with them before and they were saving a ton of money but it was a good chunk and if i could find some more clients i could make work and so that's what i did i just went into business for myself um in the spring of 2013 at doing communications consulting for people primarily focusing on copywriting and copy editing and so social media management. And so since early 2013, that's what I had been doing for quite a few years. And then in the spring of 2020, when the provincial government brought in all those public health protections related to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of my clients had shut down and they had no revenue coming in. And so they had to cancel my contracts. And so I ended up losing every one of my clients and it was tough. And it was back to where I was when I was let go in 2013. I was looking for work. I was trying to see if I could get more clients and nothing was working out. I had been writing poetry and writing articles about various issues in Lethbridge. Nothing regular, just once in a while. A lot of it related to the supervised consumption site. And I had had a Patreon uh, account set up and a PayPal thing set up. And so I had had a few people sign up to be subscribers, but I was only making like 75 bucks a month or something. It wasn't very much money. But since I had time on my hands, I was doing some research into an issue that somebody had mentioned to me on social media. And I found a lot of information that really was very interesting. And so I put it all together and wrote an article up and uploaded it to my the website I was using, shared it on social media, and then it kind of went viral. And I got a lot of traffic and even had a couple of people sign up to be subscribers. And I also got a real interview. And I wrote another article that sort of went viral too. And then I got a couple more subscribers and I realized, you know, I might be able to do this. If I could just keep pumping out articles, I might be able to get more subscribers and just make a living off of this. And so I just refocused my efforts. I stopped looking for work. I stopped looking for clients. And I just started writing news every day. For the first little while, I think I was writing two news articles a day, uh, but now, I just ended up writing uh, one news article a day. That's what I've been doing ever since. Oh, there was one job I forgot to mention. There was one point back in 2018, I think it was, I did a couple semesters as a academic writing tutor at the University of Lethbridge in their writing center. They had somebody go on maternity leave and there were some people who are on health leave or something like that, sickness leave or something. So they needed somebody to come in and help out and they knew that I was already doing copywriting and copy editing. And so they figured I could probably help out with that. And so I did, I did that for two semesters plus the summer semester. So I guess technically three, but it was on a contract basis. And then after the year contract was over, then that was it. I was done working for them. So that was technically the last job I had. This is where I'm at now. I'm working with the Alberta Worker and probably familiar. If you've heard of the Alberta Worker brand, you're probably familiar with my news writing, which I've been doing for a little over two years now. It used to be my full-time gig, but now I'm also uh, being a stay-at-home parent. And so my news writing is my part-time gig, I guess. I go back and forth between the two, but the amount of content I'm putting out hasn't changed. I'm still putting out a, a new story every day. Always have for the last little over two years, at least one a day. Sometimes I do two and occasionally I'll do one on the weekends, but I don't, don't usually do one on the weekend. But now I am expanding into podcasting as well, at least on a uh, occasional basis. And so here is the first episode of the Alberta Worker podcast. That's pretty much about me. So if you have questions about my labor history, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, just 
comment in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. You can also go to albertaworker.ca slash contact and find various ways to contact me. You can ask me on there. You can ask me on social media and uh, I'm more than happy to answer there. If you want to find out more about the Alberta Worker Project or about me in general, you can find me on most social media platforms. Just search for Kim Siever, K-I-M-S-I-E-V-E-R, and you will probably find me there. I'm on most major pl platforms. Uh, and then you can just follow the Alberta Worker. Alberta Worker is on Twitter and Facebook and uh, LinkedIn. It used to be on Instagram, but Instagram shut down my account for some reason. And then of course you can just check out albertaworker.ca. This is the next and installment in the Alberta Worker Media Project. Um, I have some more plans for other projects in the future, but like distant future, months and months, if not years ahead, depending on how things go with the Alberta Worker. I'm not going to say anything now because I don't want to jinx it, but we'll see how it goes. So I would be interested in your feedback. So hit me up on social media. Let me know what you think about this new podcast and about the ideas, suggestions or questions, criticisms. I'm pretty thick skinned, but sometimes I get offended. Uh, but after I I think about it for a few, for a little while I will probably come to your side um, so if you have some suggestions let me know and if you think that you would fit with the type of guest that I would like to have on the podcast then let me know I would love to chat with you about that or if you know of somebody who you think would be a great guest on this podcast let me know or, or let them know so remember it's people who are part of the working class but who fit within other marginalized identities and so they could be uh, women or of other genders or they can be black and or indigenous workers or other workers of color they could be disabled they might be from a religious minority so they could be like muslim or jewish workers for example and they might be queer workers so those sorts of things as long as they are part of another marginalized identity other than the working class then I would love to be able to chat with them and talk about their work history, their personal history, and their worker stories from a worker perspective. So you sort of got a taste of what it's like with this podcast. And to give you a heads up on who is going to be the guest for episode number two, it is going to be Christy Thomas, who is the current president of the Lethbridge and District Labor Council. I'm really excited about meeting with Christy, finding out about her personal labor history, and then as well talking about the Labor Council and and what, sort, what its role is, how she got involved, and maybe some of its history and that sort of thing. Should be pretty exciting. So tune in next week and be able to see how that interview goes. Thanks for tuning in and solidarity.